<clears throat> okay hey what's up you guys how's it going um hopefully everything is going well for you audio check i do see that the mic is catching my voice so everything looks good video is there uh just doing a quick tech check as always um just to kind of introduce what's going to happen for today as you can see obviously i have a couple of books in front of me uh we'll be doing several things obviously this was based on request from the last session that we had uh, we were supposed to do this yesterday, but uh, it just got a little bit later in the day. They didn't want to stream so late at night, but also in an hour where it wasn't accommodating for some people. Also some international as well, too. So I figured if we start a little bit earlier, uh, it might give a chance for some people in Europe or possibly even Asia if we can get them. So in any case, uh, let's chat a little bit. We do have the first dynamic Bible. I also have brought out my original one. Some of you may have seen it. A lot of you may, may not have a copy of this. But I figured I'd go through a bit of a walkthrough today of some of the books um, and just kind of talk a bit about one, what they are, what they contain, the comparison between these two, uh, go through them, especially the newer one in pages and talk a bit about how I as a student would basically use something like this. Uh, back when I first released the book, I actually did make a, a video that went through um, kind of like what we're doing today, a demo process and how I would actually use this. Um, but I figured it'd be nice to do another update just to kind of talk a bit about not only about the current book, but then about the future. So, you know, the question I get a lot of times, of course, is when is number two coming out? And I have repeated this several times in live streams as to like my intentions and plans. Uh, but I figured I would talk, you know, a lot more in detail if I can about the intentions uh, into this particular year for the Dynamic Bible. So, um, you know, we'll see how many viewers we get today. And uh, we're starting to get some people in right now. I know they're welcome uh, and appreciate everybody. Hope everyone is, again is doing well. Hope you guys can also hear me well enough. Uh, if you need me to increase audio, I'll try to move the mic or speak a bit louder if I can. Uh, but in any case, uh, I also have some materials. I am going to bring, bring some paper out because I figured I would also sketch a little bit with some of the pens and whatnot and talk about materials as we also go into the book also. Because talking about the book's content is one thing, but also if you're not really getting the insight about how you could be using it as a student, especially when it comes to using stuff like this, uh, it can feel a bit squirrely as to like where to go with it. So uh, let's talk a bit about the history of this book first. Uh, hey, how's it going, Danny? Um, we'll talk about the history of as to how this particular book came about, the first one. Uh, when then the second iteration or the first one out of Superani Publishing came out then afterwards. Uh, then of course, you know, the future, into the, into the future for this year and how it's going to go. Initially, this first book, uh, when I was released, of course, you know, um, wasn't something that was planned years in advance. A lot of the stuff I did in the past, uh, usually self-publishing was pretty much, you know, something that I had an immediate thought to it that, you know, why not? You know, it's like it'd be fun to kind of play with. And it always kind of starts off as a personal endeavor, as, a, as an interest in a project for myself. And then, of course, it spreads out into things that can cater to people that are out there as well, too, based on response and feedback and whatnot. So um, 2016 is when I produced this book, self-publishing. I went through Kickstarter. Uh, I printed it over in Asia. I had it shipped over to the U.S. and I distributed it and shipped them out myself. Uh, quite the or endeavor and the ordeal of work. And then, of course, I took them to many comic cons and shows and sold this book there as well, too. So in 2015, at the end of it, is when I decided to actually start creating content uh, that you know, obviously is connected to uh, this particular class that I taught of dynamic sketching, which is why it's called the Dynamic Bible. Uh, the title itself always kind of threw people off. You know, people always kind of thought it was some sort of like religious thing uh, at Comic-Con shows and stuff like that. Because I wouldn't, there was no artwork on the cover of it. So it was a little bit misleading, I think, at that times. But um, I don't know. That's why, especially with the newer cover, I wanted to incorporate things like symbols and icons and things that were a bit more, uh, you know, having a little bit more information as to what it could be about. Um, it can be a bit of a hard sell, I can understand, because the title is misleading. Uh, it doesn't really give a lot of information as to what this is supposed to be. But either way, this is a collection or a tome of a bunch of notes and uh, insights and advices towards how I would treat the approach towards the dynamic sketching method. So the class itself I taught for now up to this point over 12 years. Uh, but when this book came out, you know, it was uh, w well into about six years of teaching. So in 2015, I decided to start jotting down my notes as to like, you know, how, uh, well, really, if, if 
if it made sense, you know, as to like the, the content of what I was explaining and lecturing in my classes in person, like at the Art Center College and whatnot. So I really wanted to see for myself as to like how it felt because I would put them on the chalkboard uh, and I would explain verbally and I would show people in you know, demos and classes to how I would approach this stuff. But I didn't really ever collect it into like a whole, you know, uh, process of, of notes and thoughts behind how I would maybe want to curate this. So uh, after five, six years of teaching, I decided to kind of do that. And I spent about five months in 2015 starting to just jot all these notes down. And I would share it on my Instagram and people would be very interested in having copies of this stuff because, you know, as an Instagram post, the images were relatively small, so they wanted to be able to see it more clearly. So requests of things like books coming out would be a, a, a question that would pop up here and there. And at the beginning, I was actually uh, a little bit unsure as to what I was going to even do with this because the initial start to this exercise was, in, was for myself to understand what I'm speaking of, if it makes sense or not, or if it's clear as it needs to be. So I really wanted to go through a process of just slightly editing, uh, streamlining, focusing some of that information, even after five years of teaching it. Uh, so this first book, obviously, in the first section, goes through the initial exercises of the lines, the circles, the shapes and stuff. Uh, we, we do things like dissections and cross-contouring, and shape building, form building. But as you can see, you know, this is about maybe, what, one two three four five six pages of actual you know exercise work you know so keep that in mind um this first book was was treated as essentially an entire collection of all the content based on subject matter and methods and techniques that i, that I taught in the class put into a single uh what would be the best word for this a single well i mean a collection right um a book for all of that information so I wasn't intending to continue this book in additional uh, let's say you know future content or, or issues or um, even variations to this it was just supposed to be ending at that point and that was it because again it was mostly for myself to move forward on things uh, so in any case, once the book was done, I published it and put it out there. Uh, it, it did well for me. Of course, you know, people were very interested in, in knowing more about the book and whatnot. And I printed on this really high-end quality watercolor paper. So this book was not cheap. Uh, I think in term, I'll talk a bit about how I also published it as well, too. So uh, I put it on Kickstarter. I think I made about 55K, less than 50, about 51K uh, based on Kickstarter funding. Now, that money is not profit. That money is pre-orders coming in to help produce and make copies of this book up to that point all i have is the original content scanned and designed but i never really printed it up that up to then that point just yet so once the kickstarter goes and fulfills and, and uh fully you know is successful in the campaign is then when i can start to submit you know to get the book printed so each book cost me about i think 12 to 15 dollars but then you times that by like you know, i printed like 2,000 copies or something like this so it was not cheap to make you know, ten to fifteen dollars a book of copy uh, is not cheap to produce. So uh, it's because the paper was you know high end, it's like a watercolor paper. Uh, it is soft cover, but you know I have gold foil on there, that kind of stuff, and it's quite thick. You know, so um, after I made it, of course, shipping costs, shipping it from Asia to the U.S. on the boat, also not cheap. Uh, then also like the the materials for you know packaging and whatnot that to ship myself uh, also then costs. So all of that has to be budgeted uh, going into things like the Kickstarter campaign. So um, once all that comes through, mo all that money is spent for that, right? Um, and then, of course, feature print runs that I would want to do for shows and whatnot. Um, so anyways, the first section of the book really goes into all the exercises, six pages of it. And then in between, I, I included these worksheets uh, that were blank. And it was kind of a last-minute decision of designing the book as to why I wanted to do this because I really wanted to have this be treated like an actual textbook. And in textbooks in high school and stuff like that, when I was a kid, like in math books and whatnot, I would write a lot of notes in there, right? There'd be like answer sheets in the back and you would do tests in between. And so, um, you know, I would produce uh, these pages in between for then people to work on. The general response, of course, going to Comic Con and show is that, oh, I'm never going to draw on this book, you know, because I'm, I'm selling these for like 50 bucks a copy. Uh, so, you know, of course, that's not cheap for the customer as well, too, but I had to obviously charge that for. Uh, you know, to make back in any way of, of form of profit um, for the time I put in, right? But anyways, I put in about three sheets of these worksheets in there. I also then include a little checklist as like things you could do. 
uh, the first checklist was like, you know, do lines, arcs and waves, circles and ellipses, and things like the contours. So then you can maybe practice it on this page. And, it, and there have been books I have seen that people did draw on these. And I really appreciated that because I know it's scary to work in, but that's, that's also part of the learning process, right, uh, to commit to. And then so each section has um, subject matter. So we have plants here. Now as you can tell, uh, there's color in this. And so when I initially did these in 2015, um, as I was doing them for myself, I did them in a watercolor sketchbook made by, I think it was Strathmore, um, Strathmore sketchbooks. And uh, I did watercolor for them. And I did them mainly because I wanted to present them well and I wanted to be like a nice coffee table book uh, as also a workbook. And it was able to be designed in a way where spreads and the, you know, the layouts could be uh, read through easily but also appreciated as being like an art book, right? So a couple of questions here is, uh, uh, Dimashi's Dave is asking, when did I start this book in particular? I started doing the art in 2015. It took me about five months to produce all the content. I think I started in like November of 2015 and I finished in like December, end of December, something like that. Maybe beginning of January. So it's about five, six months. Um, and then I started putting the book together uh, and I did the Kickstarter in the middle of 2016, something like that. Question from uh, here, another question is, am I thinking of making it available on Kindle? I won't be, I don't do digital books. So people have asked like, can you make a digital book that you can like download or have on Kindle? It's like, I don't do digital books. Uh, I appreciate more printed copies like this. Now it doesn't mean that digital versions like this don't exist. People have made copies of it, digital copies without permission, you know, as you know, online bootlegs or, or whatever the case is, rips. Uh, and some of them I've had to qu squash. There was somebody selling one of these uh, on Amazon as either a digital copy or something like that. And so it actually was last year and I contacted Amazon to shut it down. But the thing is, stuff like this exists as content. So if you found it on Google, I can't stop you from buying it, but I would hope you wouldn't, right? <laughs> Anyways, you can't stop that as an artist in general. People are going to steal things. People are going to create knockoff copies of it. Uh, that's just the way it goes in our industry, you know? But anyways, I don't do digital versions of stuff. So if you guys ever find digital copies of books of anything I've done, uh, they don't exist officially. All right. So um, as you can see, again, watercolor was done for these. And there's actual, you know, uh, information of notes about techniques and methods and processes of shapes and whatnot. And then there's like watercolor pieces that are like inserts that have art value to them that are the applications of the information to the images show you what I would do with it basically. <clears throat> Jabez is asking, will the book be available on the registry or Europe again? Especially when it comes to the first book, I honestly can't tell you. I don't know. Uh, Superani is a publisher for the, the newest book and I don't run the whole shipping and export and distribution at all. Uh, I just made the book and they handle everything. I've contacted them saying, you know, will they get books in the future, but I haven't heard back just yet. So I think a lot of it has to do with just the pandemic stuff, but at this time it's like, that should be over by now. But even then it's like, I think another part was the recent Kim jong passing has kind of upturned Superani a little bit in terms of where the focuses are. Uh, so it might be a bit of time until they get more updated copies of books, hopefully soon, all right? Yeah, so DSC is saying that in Brazil, it's, uh, it's hard to find books for sale. And I understand. It's not just in Brazil. In South America in general, uh, getting copies out there, hard copies, is difficult. Also, like in Australia, is really difficult to get to for some reason. Even in just down south in Mexico as well. Uh, shipping has, has been a bit difficult, I would say. Um, a lot of it's because they've lost some of the distribution people and partners in the past couple of years. Uh, it's, shipping is annoying. If you do any sort of like distribution work in the, in the, for yourself, you would understand what I'm talking about. Printing, bookmaking, and, sh and uh, shipping distribution is annoying as hell. Uh, so here is a section on bugs. So as you can see, again, notes, information on shape and process. Everything was hand note written here in this particular book. And I wanted this particular first book to make it feel like it was an original, like it was actually you know something that you were buying, but it felt like it was an actual copy of my own book originally. Now this is all inkjet printing. So if you look up close on it, it, it looks pretty dang on close to the originals uh, if you saw my you know actual books as well too. I wish I actually brought them in. They're in my garage. Uh, but in any case, you, know, you can see the watercolor um, bleeding and the ink quality, the texture. The scale is close to it. 
it's, it's not very far off to the actual sizing of the original books itself. I think the originals are like nine by, no, not nine, six by something. And so this one is a little bit larger than that. So, but they're relatively close in terms of size. We'll just go through this book real quickly. And then I'm going to jump to the newer book and we'll talk about how we can use it. Anyway, this is the 2016 copy. This book is no longer available. And I don't know if I will be making it available into the future at all. Uh, it's one of those situations where um, copies that I've made are, are copies that I've made. And the content that's in the, in the book is still relatively useful, but it's been, you know, more than, what is it? it was 2016 when I made it, so it's been more than four or five years. So um, I don't know if it's, it's viable as a resource to be able to use because what I talk about and teach now is, I mean, it's relatively the same, of course, but uh, it's still old content, you know, and I'm always in the camp of making new work and never recycling the old stuff as much. Um, so instead, I'd rather make new stuff, which is why we'll be doing more of these. But the old one over here will probably most likely never be out there again uh, in terms of where I'm at personally. But never say never, right? So you can see some of the internal is inserts of paintings and whatnot. Now, the, the newest book doesn't have watercolor work in there. And even though this may look aesthetically nice in terms of having color in the book, I, I decided upon not having watercolor in the newest iterations of the Dynamic Bible, mainly because the color, when I started getting feedback from people, they would talk to me about you know some of the work they were doing out of the workbooks and whatnot. For them, they were concerned, like, oh, I wanted to do some of the watercolor. Can you tell me how to do that? I mean, the book doesn't have anything when it comes to watercolor techniques. That was an issue. You know? So... Um, I didn't want people to get distracted by the color and also not to be influenced by it over, or, and prioritize in different directions where the priority within dynamic sketching is about building shape and form and constructing and drawing through. Color is just a secondary element in that, that you add to for aesthetic value, yes, and it does make the drawing look nicer, but that's not the focus of the book. So it didn't make sense for me to actually add more color for the newer iterations because, again, like I said, I think it would, it would kind of... Um, add a, a mix of the message that isn't really appropriate, right? The Void is asking, uh, do you think an artist needs an iPad today to be effective in terms of freelancing, or is it possible to take commissions traditionally nowadays? It's all depending upon what kind of work you want to do, right? I mean, if we just simply label commission as getting, uh, let's say, a client coming to you asking for a commission of an illustration. Now, they can dictate what they would want, whether it's an original or digital piece, and then you can price that according to what you feel is most fair. But you can also be the one to set the terms as to what you would prefer to work in as a medium. You could say, why well, tradi I work traditionally primarily. Well, then that's what the person will pay or not. Uh, you could set the terms of, I'm only going to be de doing digital work, and somebody can pay for that pricing or not. Now, t uh, typically, I do more traditional work, right? I still do digital if professionally hired to do things like any game or uh, even illustration work and whatnot. But if I, if I got asked to do like a gallery piece, if I got asked to do, let's say, a commission at a convention uh, or even commission online, I mostly do them on paper with watercolor and pen. So usually those prices would be a lot higher than digital, right? So with a digital print, it's not the same value as an original piece you would make on paper, obviously. So uh, I would prefer to have it as an original because that's also what I would want to have. So I also go by the preferences of things that I'm interested in going so you are the one that can decide these things, right? There is no right or wrong there based on should I use digital or not or traditional. And you may think, but is there enough work of this, enough work of that? Doesn't really matter. You should stick to the things you feel that are in your line of sight of interest, of things you want to produce. Uh, if you're only conforming to produce things to become, let's say, popular or to make a lot of money, I mean, that could be some of the goals of things you can strive towards. But if you're just beginning, those, you know, uh, initial thoughts are not going to help you become successful in any way because you can have those things as a byproduct eventually, but in the beginning, those aren't the answers to get the work you need to get in the first place. Just start going, right? Uh, stick to the things you know you are um, not only just what well, you're interested in, mainly because it shows the quality through the work. Because if you're forcing it to be something that is not something you really enjoy, it, you'll see it through the pieces. Anyways, here's some of the additional notes on uh, we switched from organics, fish and stuff like that, and then we switched over to hard surfaces, which I included additional notes on materials. 
I uh, went to the trains, a lot more notes in here about the actual... And again, some of the techniques here are not really techniques of drawing. A lot of these are also just notes. Notes on like the, the machine or the subject itself. Our worksheets, and then we go to cars. Talked a little bit about the perspective of, of cubes. And then we go in, you know, it's a single page here. And then we go into the breakdown of uh, side views of the vehicle, of the automobile. We go into a little bit of the wheels. Which I don't fully explain everything here either, too. Because it's older content. Then illustration. Then we do modern vehicles. Then another illustration. Uh, John Doe's asking, uh, odd question, was there any particular reason or motivation you had for making the dynamic Bible at the time you did? Uh, there was a motivation because it was a motivation of not being 100% confident that what I was talking about made sense to students is the reason why I made this book, okay? The reason why is because, again, after teaching for five years or so, uh, I wasn't sure if people really understood what I was talking about, right? I didn't even know if I really knew what I was talking about. I knew the methods and I would draw all the time, but was I verbally making sense? Were the drawings that I was doing to an honest opinion on how I would approach this stuff? Or was it only replicating what my teacher, Norm, was doing, which was the initial problem the first year or two of teaching, is that I would try to replicate what he would say and how he would draw things. But after five years, was I really honestly expressing the ways I would teach it, right? So then I decided to make this book by jotting all the mental notes down. Um, and then it gave me a visual information based on, well, what do I need more of? Does it make sense? Do I need to kind of break it down further? Uh, and so that helped me as an educator to figure out if this method and process was in alignment to being strong. And that's the reason why this book exists, this first book. Appreciate that, Kay, for the support. Thank you again. And the last sections are airplanes. And then weapons. I still like these pages. I mean, the drawings are fine. <laughs> Uh, there's no reason why I couldn't reprint something like this in the future. Um, after this one, I wonder if I have it here. Hold on. Let me see. Yeah. Excuse me. So after I made this 2016 book, I have a, a little rare piece, actually. Sorry. Just my chair. I made this. Uh, this is the Dynamic Bible Companion. So this is a, a rare one. <laughs> uh, on Amazon, somebody was selling a knockoff of this and this as a digital copy. I don't know how they got a copy of that. But anyways, uh, after I made the Dynamic Bible in 2016 and put it on Kickstarter, I had a little extra reward for the backers. So this book was only available to people that got the original book on the Kickstarter campaign. And beyond that, there's no more copies of this small book. I think I only have literally a handful of some of these. Um, and this is, you know, a, a small little collection of additional notes. I'm going to zoom in on this. Oops, sorry. Of content that doesn't exist in the bigger Dynamic Bible, the original one. So these are just small little uh, subjects of animals or vehicles or uh, of different varying things. And I would show them how I would draw this, the stuff, basically. So this is the companion book. I even, it's funny because there's, there's information in here that um, is kind of fun, where it's not even just singular subjects like, oh, here's how to draw an octopus. But then it's like, oh, how do I make something cute? The printing on this was terrible, honestly, because uh, the binding on it really cut into the pages. Here's one on skulls. Here's one on figures on, this is back in 2016 too. Forms and different angles, drawing hands. Uh, a little bit of natural landscapes, some of the architectural work. This is a drawing of the, um, it's like an industrial kind of building structure near Art Center that I drew from observation. This is another building structure near, near where we live. Some effects. This is a, a rare section too, a re really fun one, one of my favorite spreads. Effects like smoke and fire and water, and dust effects and lightning. 
This is a GB airplane, 1930 something, 31. That's a Morgan, 32, 1932. It's a Cobra helicopter. I got to fly in one of these. I was in the passenger seat. And that was it. So this is the old little companion book that came with the original bigger one. So this was 2016 of when I made this book. Uh, had about a good two or three year stint of um, producing this book over and over again under my own thing. And then, you know, going to shows and conventions and, and you know, selling it there. Today, we have now the newest one. Uh, let me talk a bit about more of this. Let me open this first. It's actually sealed. I only have one copy of this at home. <laughs> and this is my only sealed copy. So I'm going to open it for you guys here. No, no, John, uh, th those drawings were, were done to a larger size and shrunken down to be in the book. Okay, so this is the uh, new Dan McBible issue one. Now this one was, there's information on the inside. Uh, so this was done in 2020. So uh, I actually started the actual content, uh, the drawings and sketches inside in 2019 at the end of 2019 it took me about three to four months to finish this first iteration uh, in terms of all the originals in fact if you guys want to see i think i have my originals right over here let me check real fast give me one second Yeah, Brad Pyre, I got to fly in the Cobra helicopter. Uh, my dad was in the U.S. Army, and he actually got to work on Cobra helicopters. I don't remember exactly what his job role was. He, I think he worked on as an engineer or something like that, um, or mechanic, essentially. <clears throat> um, this is about four or five years ago. They had a, you get to fly inside the Cobra helicopter if you find, signed up for it at the uh, Air Museum down in Chino. So I got to fly in one. It was cool. So this book, or this not book, but this case, uh, has all the originals. So these are the original pages of the uh, Dynamic Bible, the new one that I have right now. Let me bring these out. So these were done on Bristol paper. And this is like a, what size is this? I don't even know. I want to say it's like 9 by 12 maybe. This is A4 size, A9 by 11. So it's a little bit bigger. It's about 9 by 12. And uh, I started this in 2019, and this is just straight ink into the page. And how I did this first is that I actually thumbnailed these pages as a smaller iteration, digital actually, in Photoshop. So I thumbnailed all my pages. Um, you know, just to get a sense about how many pages a book was going to be, what the composition was going to be about, what the content is, and also I had to write out all these notes. So I had to plan that out uh, if I'm publishing something. So this first book, I thumbnailed everything. After the first thumbnail round on digital, I went straight into the pages and they just went straight ink. So uh, let me answer some of the questions we have some above as well, too. Um, Mama Head asks, you know, you like to draw everything. Basically, you're, you're asking that, you know, uh, you say that I do like to draw everything. As a teacher, do you know why people gravitate to different things to draw? Why do people like characters versus landscape, etc.? Can it be changed? That's all personal, you know, interests of things. What catches your attention? And I think this is just the way people, humans, are just wired, right? What do we find aesthetically pleasing? What do we find interest to that we think we put the cool factor to, right? Um, some people find things like animals and creatures to be incredibly, uh, you know, uh, mesmerizing and attractive. Other people find things like automobiles and cars and weapons to be equally as, and vice versa. There could be some people that find everything equally as interesting. 
Now, does that mean I started off with equalizing everything at first? Not necessarily. You know, when I was younger as a kid, I was very much into things uh, that were more character-based and creature-based. Mechanical stuff here and there, like vehicles, I didn't draw as much as a kid. Up until high school, I didn't really draw that kind of thing. Uh, mostly characters. But once I got into Art Center and I became, you know, a student learning these methods and techniques, drawing things like vehicles and whatnot became, you know, something that was new to me. But also I found that eventually much more interesting. So I was able to not sway my attention to the opposite side away from characters. I was able to incorporate it, right? Um, and I could talk about this for hours, but basically, basically, for myself, I began to understand that there was no separation between something that was mechanical, like vehicles and cars, and something that was very organic, like fish and skulls and, and humans. Because the, the fundamental process that came from this particular class allowed me to understand that they're unified based on the fact that I'm trying to understand how to build them properly based on shape, proportion, perspective, or whatever the case is. So then the subject matter really isn't the point. It's about the method of thinking and how we see the world around us. Then we can appreciate all of them as equally. Then eventually over time, as you research more based on curiosity, as you build that sense of interest, you're able to curate that information of things like what they are, how they work, where they came from, what's the history of that stuff. And you begin to appreciate them a lot more as well too. I think we can also say that when you're younger, your attention span is not as very strong. So you're not probably not going to be as interested in researching all these different various things because you're trying to go, right? Um, but as you get older, you know, as you get older a little bit, there's that sense a little bit more of appreciation to the things that are around you uh, as you're aware of time passing by a lot more. So you want to actually absorb as much as you can, right? When you're younger, it doesn't really matter as much. And I can see that when I was younger, I didn't care about everything like this. Right? I didn't care about history as much. I didn't care about functionality of things. There were things I just found cool and aesthetic based on not necessarily what was popular, but of course, you know, what, what I thought was a cool factor of things like the comics and anime and stuff like that I used to watch. Uh, so I was interested in characters and creatures and weapons based on the influences of medium that I was exposed to. But of course, you know, as time goes by, these actual things I'm, I'm now drawing in the world around me, I become more appreciative too. Uh, so I think it's something that can be built and learned. But you're not necessarily trying to change who you are, right? Uh, but I hope that makes sense, Lama. <laughs> so it's one of those cases, it's not really an answer. Um, but at, this, at the beginning, when you're younger, it's important that you do find something of interest, even if it's singular, and don't feel like you have to expose yourself to all those things that have an equal amount of interest in the very beginning. It will grow to that direction. And even if it doesn't, if you end up specializing, it's okay too. At the end of the day, it's about being just true to what you like and sticking with that, right? I hope that makes sense, though. Uh, let's see. Give me one second here. Just kind of catching up to some other questions. So we're getting questions about, am I making more of the Dynamic Bible book? Uh, let's see. And what is my, we are going to, essentially. Yes, Lucas. Thank you for all the comments above for the cover. And let's see, what do you take on balancing technical skill and knowledge and personal art and sketches? <clears throat> I mean, of course, you know, when you're trying to balance the two things together, the idea is first you have to be able to link them together, right? Because we can focus on the fundamental practices like this that I'm offering and spend all our time trying to, you know, up our skills to understand these as well as we can. Um, but it doesn't go anywhere until we start using it for something, right? So then there's the other side part, which is not just from the, the techniques of something like this. So I'm going back to that question again. Um, but then, you know, talking about things like personal art and sketches, because in personal art, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't use your techniques and things, your skills that you're building. You obviously have to bring them in. So they're always tied together in some way. If you produce your own personal work and you're training in something based on school, to, to isolate them and separate them doesn't make sense to me at all. So when you're making personal sketches, the idea is it's a time for you to start using what you're learning. When you're learning based on educational systems and stuff, yeah, you're not drawing, you're not drawing something that is personal to you. You're training your, your techniques on being able to understand the method, right? But eventually it has to be bridged over to something that is going to be personal of interest. So they are connected. They're not, they can't be disassociated. Anyways, uh, let's see, let me read any last questions here before we move on. Um, K. 
Okay, Thompson's asking, so is the Bible more about gaining confidence with your line and gaining structure with your drawings? What's the end goal for someone working through the Bible? Good question, actually. And that's what actually we're going to go through here, Cade, uh, a bit more about what this content is. So kind of hold on to that thought, and I'm going to go through this uh, in the very moment. Let me just see if there's any last questions here. Found my old dynamic figure drawing course. Finished yesterday. Okay. Good to hear that, Ada Nerd. Um, hey, hey, Tim is asking, am I completely opposed to pencils? No, of course not. Pencils are a perfectly fine material to draw with. We don't use it in this technique and method, and there's a reason why. Uh, pencils have a benefit, which is that you're able to have uh, two strengths. One, you can obviously erase it, right? So you can undo what's been done, depending on the pencil you're using. Two, you can also lightly draw with it and feather your approach to slowly build up to your illustration or sketch or to whatever you're doing. Uh, so, I mean, there's a third one too. Third is that there's a good amount of variation that can be produced by the pencil based on line and value. You can be light with it, which is connected to the whole feathering thing that we do. So, but what that doesn't do, it doesn't create the sense of confidence within your line work, all right? Because you know that you can erase it. You know that you can feather it. You know you can lightly lay it in there and slowly build it up. All it does is it creates a sense of hesitancy, in my opinion. You can create beautiful illustrations with pencils. So again, I have nothing wrong with that tool. But if we're talking about being, being able to sketch and communicate through a confident mean of building strong line confidence and, and quality, the pencil doesn't give that to you, right? So I prefer the people to use pens. So the first, now no, this, let's go into this book now. Um, the Dynamite Bible 1, I did this in 2019, which is the original I just showed you. 2020 is when we actually um, printed it. But we didn't start selling it in 2020. And we put it on hold, uh, even though we had finished it. Well, no, we, we, we sold it online, but we didn't sell it on location. So there were no Comic Cons, no shows. Everything was canceled because of the pandemic. So in 2020, when this book was done, uh, it was basically in a stock facility. And we were just selling it online here and there. 21 comes by, nothing happens again. All the Comic Con shows are you know, closing down. Uh, we have nothing to go towards. We're still selling this book online, but we didn't make a secondary version. And people are asking now, it's like, where's number two? You know, I thought you were making one every year. That was my initial plan. The reason why we didn't is because the first book, even though we launched and sold online, we didn't really make an official, you know, uh, rounds of Comic-Con shows to be able to sell the book in person. For me to be there, to sign it, to draw on it, because all the books that were sold online were never signed. They were never drawn in. And Superani uh, kind of holds the badge of, of you know, the, the idea of having artists come around the shows and promoting and selling the book in person, like what Kim Jong-gi would do, right? So uh, it wasn't officially really launched at that point. It was sold online, but not really, you know, released in a way. So in 2022, last year came around, was when we started doing our first shows. So Comic-Con San Diego was the first Comic-Con show I had done with Superani. And we brought this book. And that last year was literally the first time we had taken this book to a Comic-Con show or any show into the year. So I went to like Florida, San Diego, um, a couple other places in the U.S. and shows to sell this book in person and sign and draw on them. This is why the second book doesn't exist yet. Because we wanted to wait to get all the shows out of the way first to release the first one. And then I'm now releasing number two. So as basically an idea that the second book will be hopefully coming out this coming year. 23. So I'm going to start working on it at the beginning of spring. It will take me about two or three months to produce. Um, maybe even earlier if I can, so I can get it done by March. So uh, from there, hopefully I'll have it ready for the summer or fall of this year, essentially. Uh, it is not on Amazon. You can go to superaniaus.com. And uh, Patrick, yeah, the book, unfortunately, you know, if you live in the UK, uh, that site is only for the US kind of like market but liberdistry.com is where they're supposed to have it but they don't have it in stock right now so just wait a little bit and they'll probably get it at some point soon so anyways this is why this book is still in the circuit and the second book has not come out just yet so that's the whole explanation as to what's going on so this first one uh we go into the foundation now keep in mind the original dynamic bible the 2016 version it only had six pages of exercises in there right uh, this one, I think we have what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, about 
over 20 pages, 30 pages of only exercises. So what I decided to do for this new iteration, when Super Ronnie came to me saying, hey, we want to publish a book with you. you know, what do you want to do? And I proposed the idea of revisiting the Dynamic Bible. And they were okay with that, mainly because in Super Ronnie, most of the art books published by them, guys like Carl Kapinski to guys like you know Kim Jong-gi to Nicholas Namiri, Miss Jizu, they only produce art books. And in Super Ronnie, there's only a few handful of people that produce books that are more educational. So Dong Ho Kim put out the perspective book and... Uh, we have Stonehouse put out the anatomy book, and then I put, you know, this book out under myself. So there were three artists for the 2020 year that they had plans for for releasing educational format books. Um, so I, they were in plan, they were aligned with that idea of me revisiting this content. So I wanted to do it again. So to re, you know, visit this content, I wanted to redraw everything, but then basically expand on all the content and information from the technique to the materials to the mindfulness to the methods i wanted to make them much more in depth again the original dynamic bible is where did that book go sorry uh, it is far less in depth and you're talking about again we have lines here in circles here right so there is the information based on the original dynamic bible in this newer one, you know, we go into the lines, we talk about all the variations, we talk about the movement, we talk about the actual exercise, and then we go into, uh, you know, the line weight iterations, what we use the line weight for, right? Uh, when we go into the circles, it's a full page on that, but we also then go into, you know, the variations within them, and then the application within it in terms of building three-dimensional form. And then we also talk about the idea how it works in perspective ellipses and minor and major axes but here in the original dynamic bible we don't touch upon that at all you know it's just one page of ellipses and circles and that's it so this book even though it looks really nice it's actually very limited amount of information so this new one i definitely went much further into really just explaining everything behind some of the exercises and the point of them and how we can take them a bit further uh, so here we go into the shapes Cross contouring, the forms, the use of the line weight again. Here's shape relationships, how we combine forms together. We're going to go through this book at first, and then we'll go back to the beginning, and I'll do a couple exercises with you guys here. All right, I'll show you how I would use this book initially. Uh, let me answer a couple questions here. <clears throat> so one of the early questions here is, uh, what will the next you know, the Dynamic Bible 2 cover. Um, I'm going to have three different subject matters in the book. So this first one has all the exercises, and we covered two subjects in the book. We covered insects, and then we covered automobiles. So there's only two subject matters in this book. In the next one, there's going to be three subjects. Uh, one of them, as it is announced actually in the back of this book, I wanted to incorporate skeletal structure and military vehicles, but I'm adding one more subject matter. So each book into the future will have three content of subjects. Uh, the third one most likely will be either plants or something another kind of organic thing. And each book will have three contents per. How many books am I planning? Up to five. That was the plan that I had from the very beginning. Uh, five ish, or it's not even issues or iterations, but five. Um, what's the best wording for that? Uh, I don't know, five books, okay, five books. And at the end of it, I wanted to even potentially even do a mass printing of all the five books into one uh, print. So it'd be like, you know, each book is going to have in the future well over 100 pages. So we're talking about five books total. And you're talking about a 500 page book or more, you know. So um, that's what my plans in the future are. I don't have, I have no problem sharing this with you guys because I like being very open about my projects and what I'm working on. Uh, I like to also get feedback, what people think. So the Dynamic Bible 2, hopefully this year, it'll be three different subject matters, and I'll have a total of five books in the future, which will be hopefully once every year or two. Um, but that's the plan. Uh, what does availability look like in Canada? Again, uh, Liberty District is probably going to be one of the better places for international stuff. Super Honor US only does North America here in the US only. Uh, I have to ask my managers. I don't know what their plans are. 
they used to have distributors based in Mexico and Australia, and I think also in Canada, but I think they lost them. So I don't know what they're going to do, honestly. I wish I had an answer for you, Lucas, but I don't know what it looks like just yet. I'll try to find out as soon as I can. I actually have a meeting uh, with the manager, Superani, uh, in a couple of weeks, so we'll see. A couple of the comments, questions. Prokopovich is asking, uh, you understand that the topic of the stream is not about this now, but for a long time, you wanted to ask if an artist is needed for ex expeditions now. Are you talking about the expedition arts, uh, the crew that does the animal wildlife stuff? At the moment in time, not really. I'll just give it straight up as an as a answer to you that um, not really, not at the moment because it's, it's only being curated by the handful of the crew that's core member at the moment, time being. Uh, we do have a planned trip for Africa this year, actually, too. But it, the, the slots have already been filled as to who we're bringing. Um, he's bringing, my friend Manny, he's bringing a couple people from his company called Cool. They do a lot of outdoor uh, clothing wear. So a few members of that team will be coming along with us. Um, me, Manny, uh, a couple of the friends, Mostly artists and stuff are going to go at the moment of time being. But at the moment for signups, I don't know if any other plans are in the future just yet. But the best thing to do is to contact them directly, right? Uh, contact Christy Tipton or Manny Carrasco under the website of Expedition Arts and just talk to them about future opportunities, about even like group shows, even being just part of the books that they release in the future could be a part of it if you're an artist, okay? So uh, Joe the Wizard is asking, do the artists around me, like Superani, influence how you approach the techniques of the Dynamic Bible or the Dynamic Bible 2? No, they don't. So people like Carl or Kim Jung-gi or uh, Nicholas Namiri and people like that, do they influence me in producing a book like this? Mainly, be uh, No, they don't, mainly because their approach and techniques they don't necessarily fit to the methods of what I'm trying to do here. There's many different ways to sketch and draw right? To illustrate, to produce content visually. And for me, I've built off of this from my own mentor from school. So he's the main, you know, kind of comparison as to what I, what I extract information from. Uh, but the Superani people definitely inspire me to drive, to, to work hard. So that's a different level of inspiration. It's not about really necessarily the content, but to constantly produce because, you know, they're all very disciplined. Uh, and because of that, it very much rubs off. I mean, I've always been that way, but I think we all come together that way kind of same kind of mindset and it feeds into the pool of us uh so as all of us are working and staying connected together you know we always say hi to each other online on on instagram because we all live in different parts of the world but you know we always say hi to each other you know carl i'll talk to you once a month or so uh nicholas i'll say hi to and you know all these people around uh we're always in contact like elise i just you know i, I just talked to her just earlier today um so we're just saying hi as friends we don't always talk about like art and <laughs> what kind of project that we're working on we just say hi to say hi you know Let's see. In my dynamic sketching course, do I go through the, this content and these exercises? Yes. Hey, hey, Tim. So all this information of the exercises are actually explored in the classes, done in the classes, and given feedback in the classes. Okay. So Turtles, this particular book is available online at superoniUS.com. So if you're US-based, it's easier to get at the moment. International people are having a bit of trouble just at the time being because stock is kind of hard to get out there at the moment. We don't really have a lot of distributors for the time being, but we're hopefully going to solve that problem in the future. Matsura, that's the word I'm looking for. Volumes. Thank you. This is volume one. <laughs> volume two uh, this year. Why isn't this on Amazon? Because Superani doesn't put, uh, put it on there because they have their own distributors. And Amazon uh, requires that you have to put the stock of your books at their warehouses, which then also they get a cut out of. And so percentage of cut is actually relatively high, and they don't want to do that. Distribution is much higher, of course, because you hit many numbers of people on Amazon. But Superani, it's they're okay doing that because uh, it's not just about trying to reach as many people as possible. We are talking about you know not necessarily a small business, but very personal people put you know putting it together themselves. Yeah, in Canada, Labyrinth Books. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Labyrinth Books is a local distributor out there. They used to have copies, but again, same thing like Liber Distri in Europe. That would be the main contact, but I don't think they'll have copies just yet. Oh, 
Oh, is it still in stock there at the uh, Labyrinth bookstore? That's good. Yeah, Labyrinth is in Canada. Uh, I met them in person, the owner. He came to Comic-Con several years ago and bought the original Dynamite Bible, like stacks of them. Uh, and then when I released this book, he, the Super Honey team sold it to him. Uh, but I didn't know how many copies he got. Anyways, we're in the section of the uh, bugs right now. As you can see, no color, all black and white. We talk, you know, this one actually carries a lot of different stuff, like uh, the shape in the front building, uh, processes and steps, breakdowns, always showing repetition. Each of these sketches, again, like I said, I'll, I'll give you a comparison again. Now, this is, like I said, the, the printed copy of this book. This stack right here, these are the originals. These are the original pages of the Dynamite Bible. Let's jump to the insect section. Let me see if I can find that page. It's coming up soon. Sorry for the delay in this. I'm trying to find that page. What I want to do is kind of show you guys the comparisons between the two. Here it is. So here is the printed copy, and this is the original copy. Okay. So what I did in the originals uh, is I drew on and sketched the pieces here, and I'll zoom in for you guys. So I'm, I'm looking at the monitor just to make sure I'm in frame. Um, as you can see, the sketches are relatively one-to-one -one in terms of line quality, value, ink. Uh, the main difference, of course, is the text. Sorry, a bit too close. So I hand wrote all the notes in this first, and then I retyped in everything. So what I had to do uh, in this initial design of the book was I had to, um, you know, make all the original pages. This is on Bristol. Scanned it at high resolution. I usually scan it at about 600 DPI resolution. And then I had to go in there and cut out all the text. So I did delete all of them. So I opened up the negative space and then I retyped everything out. Okay. So I literally had to draw the notes in twice um, or write in it twice. So I typed in the, the, the notes. Obviously, making sure spell checking was good because my writing is terrible. So I had somebody kind of edit it, um, and I then also made a font. So this is also my font handwriting right here, I believe. Yeah. So I made this font. That was the original. So it's one to one. Zoom back out a bit more. So insects again, we have things like hatching, surfacing textures here. How do we incorporate patterns? Capturing details, other types of animals or bugs. Going into a little bit of the biology of the animal, the cephalothorax to the abdomen. Some that kind of shows the application, something a bit more illustrative. Not as technique based, but showing the application of the methods of hatching. Effect work again. So in this book, I really wanted to make sure I, I, I tried to incorporate as many notes of thought process as I could. Let's see a couple of the questions here. Um, what editions will the animals be in? Uh, most likely the third one, Luke. So the second one will have skeletal structure, tanks, and like plants. And I think the third one will have animals. Um, I think I'm gonna incorporate planes in that one, and then maybe weapons. The fourth one, I would like to incorporate clothing, um, maybe some underwater animals. And then from there, another kind of vehicle structure. Um, maybe trains, I don't know. 
here's some of the classic cars, automobiles. Again, a lot more notes going into the breakdown of how this stuff works. You know, going into things like warp perspectives, this is a four point perspective here. This is talking about the five point perspective on the bottom. This is a vehicle drawn in four point. Wheels and tires again. Building action, visual effects, blurring, motion, warping. Modern cars. And then something a bit more illustrative. And talking about the next volume. So that is the dynamic Bible. What we're going to be doing now is talking about how I would approach this if I was a student, if I had a copy of this book, and what you should or what I would be doing. I'm just going to bring in a couple of copies of just a brown tone paper. Okay, this is A4 sizing. Uh, normally, typically, and I'll talk about this a little bit, we will be using felt tip pens. But now, for now, today, I'm probably going to be using my, my fountain pen. I'll talk about materials real fast. Let me just read the last couple questions here. <clears throat> Question is, given that you collect basketball cards, uh, would you be willing to trade a Michael Jordan card for a copy of uh, my time of Bible? Uh, what, what Jordan card do you have? Uh, I have quite a few of them, actually, too. Uh, good question, though. How thick is the original Bristol paper? It, I'm not quite sure. It's just um, regular Strathmore Bristol paper, honestly. I didn't look at the thickness. Um, it was just a standard. Uh, thoughts on drawing setup. Been leaning my sketchbook against table or, or holding with your arm when looking up at the monitor so I can get exact one to one, but can't get general form proportions due to stableness. I typically draw on a flat surface. I don't draw at an angle. Okay. Uh, I don't hold my books as much unless I'm on location somewhere. Let's say drawing at a park or a zoo. Uh, but if I'm drawing, I'm typically drawing on a flat surface, but you don't want the, the, the sketch paper far away from your body, okay? So if it's too much distance from your body to the page, your arm is now outstretched. So my arm is now uh, kind of out, out like this. You don't have as much leverage and weight. So I tend to bring the sketchbook and the pages relatively close, relatively close to my body, okay? So that my arm is now bent. I know you can't see it as well, but let me see if I can zoom out a bit more. So my arm will be bent to draw with a bit more uh, pressure and leverage. So my arm is not straight out to do that. Okay, so bring the sketchbook closer to you if you can, all right? But in terms of the accuracy of getting proportion and form right, that's where thumbnailing and repetition comes into play. You're not going to get it right the first time, nor the second or third time. It's going to take you a couple of many, many cycles of repetition to get closer to its form or proportion as accurate as you can make it, right? So that's where the practice comes in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so yeah, I draw on, on, on normal surface on flat. How would you recommend learning from multiple sources? You have a Scott Robertson how to draw a book and you want to pick up my book as well. So each and all those resources are viable bits of information. Not one single book is going to give you all the information that you need, right? Like the how to draw a book from Scott is a great book. But it's so technical and so dense, but it's also specifically curated to just drawing mostly vehicles. So if I asked you, hey, let's draw an animal now, and I want you to draw with Scott Roberts' technique, you wouldn't really be able to find a connection between the two, right? But the thing is, the Scott Robertson's technique and what I do in Dynamic Bible has, you know, connective tissue. There are things I do in there and what he does in there that can be overlapped, but they come from two different voices and two different mindsets. So even though they're relatable, Coming from two different people, you get more insight of information. So you want to actually gather as much books as you can and extract the bits of information that you find very useful to you by practice, by finding it, by action, and then being able to put an application to your own work, which will then have a fingerprint of all those elements together, which is curated by you, right? Uh, do you think it's bad to use different drawing utensils without mastering one? There is no mastering, right? If I said, have I mastered a felt tip pen or a fountain pen? I have not. There is no mastering there. There's always constant exploration 
and being able to have confidence in the tool sets, right? So if you're talking about confidence level, uh, should you focus on one to get to that point and then move on to the other? Not necessarily because again, one can help another one. If I practice in my techniques of using a felted pen, will that help me with other tool sets as well? Maybe not even pen, what about like pencils and stuff? It will. This is why we use felt pens in the beginning of our class. If you brought in things like ballpoint and pencils later on in your future for your own personal work or intermixed in the, in the um, conjunction with it, it can lead into a better quality of line, right? First, let's talk about what we're gonna do here. Now answer a couple more questions. The, I have to keep track of time, by the way. I can't stay too long because I have a class at 5 p.m. <laughs> so I'm doing this with you guys and I have an actual class at five. So I can only be here for about another 20 minutes and then I have to head out, all right? So there's the last bit of information that we're doing. We have the dynamic Bible. The paper doesn't matter what you use. I just have this because I just had it on the side, all right? You can be using printer paper. You can use a sketchbook like a Strathmore. You can use loose sheets. You can use whatever you want. The paper at the moment in time being, what we're doing right now, it does not matter, okay? So get, get something that's cheap for you or something you already regularly have. I'm sure you guys have you know, stacks of sketchbooks that are empty. Use whatever you want, okay? So don't be so you know, mindful of like, oh, what kind of paper I gotta go for? Right now, it does not matter. We're just using this because I just have it on hand. Pens. This does matter. Now, for you guys as students, I would recommend you guys stick with felt tip pens. So this one right here is the Faber-Castell Pit Pen. Uh, the Faber-Castell Pit Pen uh, is a pretty typical tool you'll find in any art store. This is a B, which is a brush. Don't get this one, okay? Get the F or the M for now. Uh, the Stellar, the gray ones, three or five. Uh, the Microns, again, three or five. Medium size to fine tips, not extra fines. Small, thin nibs, you don't need, okay? So these kind of felt depends what you wanna use. You could use Sharpie. I don't see that as a problem. Uh, this only comes in, in this ultra fine point, and it's a cheap pen, relatively. But it's a different kind of ink. This is art, uh, This is more of like an alcohol-based thing, so it will bleed through this paper very easily. Um, and, the, and the speed of the pen is quite heavy. So that means when you're drawing with it, it produces a lot of ink. All right. Stick with these kind of felt tip pens for now. For our sake of the demo, I will be using a, felt, a fountain pen. Now for myself, I primarily use fountain pens for my everyday kind of drawing and sketching because there is no waste. I've gone through thousands of these pens. I've been teaching for 12 years. I went to art center for four years. I've been, you know, drawings for over 25 years, it's, you know, in terms of like coming out from school to being professional, okay? I've gone through thousands of these. So I don't really buy them off the shelf anymore. I have them still, mainly because I use it for a educational purpose to show people. And I think students who are beginning should be using these because it helps build a sense of memory, muscle memory and pressure building before they move on to a, a tool like this one here, which is a bit more sensitive. Uh, these can be a bit more expensive, um, depending on the cool tool you'll get. Some can be cheap and good quality too. One I would recommend is the Platinum, Platinum Desktop Fountain Pen, okay? Fine nib. Um, they're particularly shaped and it draws beautifully. They're like 10 bucks, all right? So that's a good fountain pen to start with. This is an Estabrook. This one costs about $190, $200, this one right here. So not every person is going to go out there and spend that kind of money on a fountain pen. But I use them. So I am, I'm a collector as well too. A tool like this will help in a tool like this because you can practice your speed, your pressure, uh, your grip, the daily drawing method and techniques that can be migrated over to a tool like this one as you build a sensitivity in your hand, motions, and your hand-eye coordination from a tool like this first, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, what brush pens would you recommend? Don't worry about brush pens right now, honestly. If you're following my techniques here, we don't use brush pens, okay? So let's open up the book. Let's just go into the first few sections here. We don't necessarily have to do the exercises right now because this is pretty straightforward and obvious to what you should be doing. We'll skip the circles because it's obvious as to what you need to do there. When it comes to the lines and circles, what I would recommend that this is a daily exercise. Okay, if you read through the part, first part of the book, this exercise of lines and circles is associated to the idea of muscle memory, movement, and the consistency of that movement to produce the exact same line and shape confidently and over and over again. Through muscle memory, there's less thinking that has to be done when you're sketching something, right? 
So if they build a circle for an animal's head, I don't have to think about how to draw that perfect circle. You can go through the motion and capture the scale and the size you need to, right? Then this is a daily exercise you should be doing for maybe five minutes a day. That's it. Just five minutes, a couple lines, a couple circles. This warm-up should be done, then move to your true homework or personal project. Let's go into maybe the shape and forms first. So in the book, we have shapes, shapes. What I distribute or define as shapes is a two-dimensional image. Two-dimensional meaning just through three-dimensional information. So here, a line of a contour or silhouette only gives us the impression of the 2D silhouette of that object. Now, these are random, blobby, organic, when I say organic, rounded shapes. Here, we incorporate the three dimensions by the visual uh, optical illusion of form by incorporating the cross contour. The cross contour gives us basically a wireframe that tells us what it appears like in three dimensional form on a two dimensional surface of paper. Okay, so if we practice this a little bit, what you want to do in, when you do get a book like this or any book into the future, okay, I'm not talking about just my book right now. I'm talking about if you're a student and you're trying to learn from books in general, how would you want to use them? The first thing to do is literally just copy the book and don't feel bad about it. It's like, well, should I just start drawing things I know how to do uh, or just look at this and create my own iteration? Eventually. But the beginning, if you're just kind of starting off and you cracked open the book fresh and new, you read through it initially, right? Go through all the pages and then go back to the beginning and still settle down, give yourself maybe an hour or two a session of time and say, let's just get warmed up and start to get familiar with this method. Take it in sections of like the chunks of chapters and then we progressively go through by weeks and the months, all right? If we had this section to begin with, let's say I isolate an area of section of interest based on the content on the page. I like that one mainly because aesthetically I choose to want to replicate it. So that's a choice that you have to make. I can replicate the entire page or I can focus on specific pieces. Of course, you should read through everything information wise, but you can also then choose what you want to be able to bring over. Let's say I choose this one initially. And what I want to do is replicate this onto the page. Now you can do this in several ways. One to one, meaning the sizing is equal to the size that you'll be drawing and sketching by eye. Now keep this in mind. Everything is being done by eye. Okay. So I'm judging by eye, how long, how tall, uh, the line quality, you know, where things are moving. And I'm trying to replicate that motion here. You may not get it perfect and that's okay. And the idea right now is that if you do it once, that's your first impression and you're most likely going to mess it up. Allow yourself to, as you mess up, what you have to be able to do is do it again. So don't just repeat it once and be like, okay, now let's just do that one. Let's repeat this one first. Let's just do this one first. Okay. In this exercise, the motion of action of line doesn't have to be done with one stroke. You can do multiple strokes from there. Okay, let's do another uh, couple of strokes of line that shows us the cross contouring. And I look at this and be like, well, okay, I try my best, but man, that part messed up and I don't like my line over here. And this is kind of heavy and the motion doesn't feel right. It's not really the scale and I feel kind of awkward. It's not one to one. Okay, now I accept that. It's not going to be equally the same as this. But what I want to make sure I get is a sense of comfort. Okay, not visual acuity, but comfort in the motion in the tool and understanding that's what we're trying to produce here. So let's try it again. This time I'm going to kind of go through the motion a little bit. Let's start to move a little bit more faster. Move around this direction. Okay. Line Let's do the cross contour. And I want to actually push my line weight this time now. Multiple strokes. Notice that I'm not doing my line weight with one complete action. Multiple strokes can be done. Now, what's the purpose of the line weight? It gives you a bit more contrast. It helps you focus as to where the weight of the form and the shape could be based on shadows, if you want it to be. It could be just aesthetic. You could choose to put the line weight entirely over the entire thing or in singular areas. Line weight is in your choice, okay? Second iteration, I felt a bit better on, but maybe I'll do it again. Maybe I'll try to draw a little bit larger 
or maybe I'll move on to something else, but at least repeating it once more will help. This you may have seen as a bad sketch in the beginning. Oh, that line quality there, that, you know, it's not so nice here, but here it, it, it looks really awkward. I didn't really get a good curvature. So you label that as bad. And how many times have you gone into a sketchbook and tried to erase it or scratch it off, right? I've seen many sketchbooks of students bring in a homework and they will scratch off a big X by saying, that one I messed up on. I don't want to show you that one. I'm going to cross it out. And here's a better one. Look at this. But how could I not look at the one that you end, ended up scratching out, right? We want to see the mistake. We want to see the car crash, right? So we tend to turn that direction. We don't want to do this because this has importance now. By repeating the sketch and getting a better iteration, there's a purpose behind the sketch that came before. No longer get to think of this as being a bad sketch. This is a process sketch. I had to do this to eventually get me to here, right? Now, some people would just get here. Well, that's a small percentage of people. Majority of us are going to mess up. So as you mess up, give yourself a chance to do it again. And know the fact that then in that process, every sketch has value. So you don't have to give yourself excuses to be like, oh, don't look at that one. And that's a really bad one. or I don't want to do it again. It leads into something good eventually. And so then every single step there has importance. So you don't have to feel embarrassed. Okay. <clears throat> From there, I can say, okay, I'm going to focus on a different section. I want to try to draw that one now. And okay, I'm going, draw, I'm going to draw this piece. I'm going to draw the shape of the outside contour first. And I have the central line with a branching center line. But you know what? Now that I copied that one, let's try to actually apply what this section's about. Well, what's this section about? I'm taking blobby two-dimensional shapes that don't mean anything, and I'm turning into three-dimensional forms. Why? Because as I draw things like animals or people, we're trying to convey three dimensions, right? So we're practicing just the idea of taking two dimensions and making them into three dimensions. Well, I have a two-dimensional one with the, uh, with the center line here, and this book does not have these cross contours yet apply. What well, has it over here? But let's say, as an example, uh, there was a shape that ended up created. There's that one. I just made that one up, okay? This one does not exist in the book. This one obviously gives me the answer right there. To a degree, it's close. Not exact. No, it's different now. So, um... This one is not the same as that, but it still gives me something close to what I need to do here, but it hasn't really solved it for me. So I have to be the one to go in there and actually adding that in to this information, right? So guess uh, the user is asking, how do you know how open or closed the contour should be? So if you're talking about the contour, we're talking about the outer line of the silhouette. The cross contour wraps around the shape. So think of it as a cylinder. And imagine rings wrapping around. Or imagine if we took, one second. Here's my forearm, okay? Here's a rubber band. This rubber band seen from a flat angle is just a flat cut. If I turn it up towards you, now you see the turn and rotation of that rubber band. That is your cross contour line, okay? So think of these lines as the rubber band wrapping around the object itself. This also means that because that information is not dictated by an actual thing that we can see, you're the one making it up. So you can make this more rounded, or you can make it more flat, or you can even turn things around by actually adding divots and valleys and concave surfaces, right? Now I make it relatively open because we are only drawing the half of that ellipse. The rubber band that we saw visually, you don't see to the other side. We only see one side of it, right? So we're drawing half of that ellipse of the cross contour because that's what we can visually capture. Now you could draw through this, right? By showing the curvature, the turn of the entire ellipse through as if it was a transparent object, if you wanted to. So here's one that I incorporated from that image. I added the cross contours. The book didn't necessarily give me this answer, but I'm practicing it now, right? This one now I created. Let's do a center line. We branch it right there. Cross contour that section. Cross contour it there. 
trying to get the sense of three-dimensional form. Okay. Actually, there's a little cool little tool here. Hold on, sorry. Let me grab this. Check this out. So this is a, uh, a little pill bug toy. I just saw this on my monitor up there. So I can open this up and you'll see the little pill bug action. So these lines here, these are your cross contour lines. So animals and humans and objects that we have in our world can visually even give you that information. These are what I call natural cross contours. So it already describes to you the curvature of that form. So in human beings, what do we have? Folds and wrinkles, right? Right here. That wrinkle of line around the wrist, that's a cross contour line. At the elbow, right here, that's a cross contour line. So on human beings, we have cross contour lines, wrinkles, folds. These are cross contour lines that we can use to visually describe the three dimensions of these objects on a two dimensional piece of paper. So I'm taking literal copies. I'm replicating something that has information that has minimal that I'm adding more to. Then I'm also creating my own, right? So each section of the book, I can do this. Replicate, solve an answer to, and then produce my own. Let's go to another section here. Ginger root, yeah, bamboo. Let's go to like an actual thing. Some arrow directions, textural callouts. Let's go to the study of bugs. So here, we're just going to draw on the other side. We have a stag beetle. In the stag beetle here, it says basic construction, cube form, draw through a line, secondary step, volume and refinement of the sketch. So we have cross contour and slight details of refinement, pushing intricate detail, surfacing texture. So one, two, three. So in a lot of your sketches and drawings, don't try to produce all that level of detail through one iteration. We repeat, 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 and build up to that level of information so we always have then the understanding where we came from, right? So to start that, same thing. I'm going to take that information and replicate it. So it is a Q form. Let me position this well. Here. Elliptical shapes, central line for the mandibles. There's an eye right there. So we repeat that and then we move on, right? We move on and do it again. So this secondary sketch still incorporates everything we had done before. Just because you see this drawing doesn't mean you just copy it. Try to understand what's behind the information of detail. It's there for you now. Let's repeat this thing again. One, two. The surface texture does a uh, the question is does the surface and texture follow the cross contour lines depending on the surface. If the surface is smooth, there might be no texture. If the texture is minimal, we would use hatching to show value. The hatching I typically follow the cross contour. Texture, that's a choice based on what you see. I follow what I observe in the texture. Let's repeat this again. This is a chance for us to adjust on proportions, the sizing of a cube, the width of it, the height of it. Let's move the eye a little bit closer to this direction here. On this, we're going to start to in create information of shapes of the mandible. When did I release the Drawing Bible? This one, I released it in 2020. Uh, we didn't sell it officially at sites or uh, on location until this last year. So 
So there's a secondary step. After the secondary step, you would do it again. Notice in the secondary step, we repeated everything we had done in the beginning. We don't skip steps, right? So here, the book is telling me all the information. Before we get to this one, if we need to, um, another thing you should try to do to expand on this. Now, this is information I give to you that the book doesn't really describe, but I can now tell you guys. To advance yourself a little bit further, if you're trying to challenge yourself, for those of you that have this book, and it's already doing what I'm doing now, because what I'm trying to do for you guys in the video is very self-explanatory. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, I just copied the book. I understand the steps. I can read that information. If I want to take it a bit further, what do I do? You have the book of information of what the subject matter is. I described to you the breakdown information of form. You can replicate that information over each of the pages. To improve on this, let's take that form before we get to the details and try to do something like this. What did I just do? I flipped the image the other direction. Let's try a different angle of view. Now I'm looking at it up at, up angle. What I'm doing right here is practicing the ability to take something that is very basic of constructive forms and moving it in space. The mentality is, if I asked you to draw me this insect from multiple angles of views, you would be like, I don't know what this detail looks like from the other side. I don't know how to draw that from a different angle. I need a reference photograph of it. I can understand that. And in some things, you would need a reference photograph because some of the details you can't remember. But if I decipher the forms, well, can you draw a box from a different angle? It only has a couple of planes of sides, right? So I can shift and move it around. From there, you're able to hopefully turn it. This is no longer an insect head. This is not a stag beetle anymore. This is a construct of form and shapes and lines. So the exercise now calls for you to move that kind of stuff in space, not to move the insect in space, but to move form in space. The more you curate that information over time as you practice on drawing details and textures and surfaces, you can still use references that in the future, but your ability to turn form will improve, right? Let's try a different angle of view now. Go down this direction. So I can take any one of these, right, and move forward and go maybe a little bit larger. Based on what I had done here, turning the form, all right, and I can start to add those details that I've already established in that second iteration. Cross contours. Different angle of view now. Now, I don't have reference for this. I have that information right there, but right now I'm practicing the ability to move objects in space. So when you're looking at a book like this, this may look aesthetic and attractive to you, but the more important ones is right there. Can you not only replicate that, but now can you also do this? Once you have the ability and the confidence to move things in space, time is always needed to build the comfort level to get more details in place. The details are not the answer. If my proportions, if my turning of angle, perspective are all weird, I don't care how much rendering and detail you put on top of that, it's still not, look, it's not gonna look uh, good at, at all. So the consistency of building proper form and proportion is the key, right? And then in, in time, to be able to get to that level of information and detail surfaces, okay? Every object in the book then, not every object, majority of the objects, will have some form of key idea of how to get the primitive level of information. 
the primitive level information. And being able to take that information that you have in front of you now and say, well, what can I do if I turn that object? Don't look at that, look at these, right? If I go a bit further, going into then the vehicles, the car, the breakdown of the form of that object. That may seem attractive and you want to detail and draw this, but you got to go to draw that first. And if I can take that and move it in space, in time as a practice and copy more of this kind of hatching and detailing, you will get there aesthetically. But to turn the form is where you have the confidence to be able to build, right? So if you do get the dynamic Bible into the future and more books and issues and volumes will come out into the future itself, that's what you want to focus on. Okay, so anyways, uh, that's a, a walkthrough for you guys to give you an idea as to how the end of the Bible can be used. Uh, I did a bit of a walkthrough of the first book and this book. Volume 2 will hopefully be out this coming year. Okay, uh, look for my Instagram to kind of post about the notes and I'll even be sharing it on there. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I just kind of share this with you guys a little bit because I felt like um, there was a lot of people of, of new interest that came into play that didn't really have that information about how to use the book. And so that's what this live stream was for. So at this moment in time, unfortunately, I have to go. I have a class starting right now, actually. So I will hopefully see you all next time and come back online, uh, maybe next week or so. I'm actually flying off to uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming this weekend. I'm going to go try to see bison and buffalo in the snow. So I'm flying out there for a couple of days and um, staying with a friend and my, man, my friend Manny. And we're going to go take photographs of wild animals in the park. <laughs> so we're going to go visit the Grand Tetons and see if we can find. I'm going to look for things like buffalo. I'm going to look for things like the... Um, uh, mule deer uh, we'll see if we can find other kinds of antelope if we can uh, it'll be fun so stuff I do right now here I'm going to be doing on site this weekend so you guys hopefully will keep drawing and sketching as much as you can use this resource information as well as you can please too but this will be back on to my YouTube channel live so you go, or not live but recorded that you can watch it again uh, but give me a subscription you know and, and uh, or give me a subscribe and share this if you can please with other people and get more people onto my channel and uh, we'll hopefully have more of this kind of content coming